Okay, here we go with lecture six about bursts of openings. The point is that the unitary event at a synapse is almost certainly not a single openings, but they're short bursts of openings. Uh, furthermore, the durations of the sh shuttings within a burst uh, may be very short, like this or that or that. So many of them are going to be missed. Well, missed events problems we're not going to deal with right now. That'll come in a, a later lecture. Uh, but the short shuttings within a burst of openings are uh, critical because they they what allow us to distinguish between binding and gating or in pharmacological terms between affinity and efficacy so the aim of this talk is to predict two things from a specified mechanism and specified value of rate constants in that mechanism it's all about predicting what will happen from a particular mechanism just as the it was in the case of open times and shut times in the last lecture and particularly there's two things we want to know we want to know the distribution of the number of openings per burst and the distribution of burst lengths so just to recapitulate the We can use this simple Del Castillo Katz mechanism once again, a simple binding of an agonist A to a receptor R, followed by isomerization of the occupied receptor to the open state. We ruled out that as an explanation for the fact that uh, relaxations are, are more or less a single exponential. We also ruled out that and we concluded that probably what was going on was something like this. Both the opening rate and the dissociation rate are fast, so the concentration of this is small. And we saw that this predicts that openings will occur in short bursts of each burst containing a few openings. That's pretty much what we see. If these are both fast, then the concentration of this intermediate will be low. It'll be short lived. And in terms of occupancies, that means it has a low occupancy. So in a simple case like this, we can work out straight away the number of distribution of the number of openings per burst. Um, suppose that we're working at a low agonist concentration that means that this state will have a long life and bursts of openings will be generated by oscillation between these two states after it's opened then there's a good chance that it'll reopen rather than dissociate so what are the probabilities of going either way Let's just start in this intermediate state. The rate constant for leaving those are beta for opening of the channel, k minus one for dissociation. So it stands, I think it's pretty obvious that the probability that it will reopen rather than dissociate will be beta over beta plus k minus one. Likewise, the probability that it dissociates rather than opening will be k minus one on beta plus k minus one. These two probabilities must add up to one because it must either open or dissociate. They're the only possibilities. So we call these sort of probabilities pi. Um, in this case, pi 1, 2 is equal to 1 because the open st state has only one place it can go, which is to the intermediate state. 
So how do we figure out the distribution of the number of openings per burst? Well, a burst must start in an open state. And a burst with one opening will occur if after it's opened, it just goes straight back to the resting state. At state one to state two to state three. And the probability of that is pi one, two, pi two, three. One, two, one to two, two to three. And since pi one, two is one, that's just one minus pi two, one. How do we get more than one opening per burst? Well, if you start here, it goes there. If it reopens once and then goes back to the resting state, then we have one to two to one to two to three. And that has probability given by this. So you can easily generalize that and see that the probability that you get r openings per burst is pi to one to the r minus one into one minus pi to one. And pi to one is the probability of going this way rather than that way from the intermediate state beta on beta plus k minus one. And that's a geometric distribution. The sum of those probabilities from one to infinity, all possible burst lengths is one. The mean number of openings per burst is given by this standard formula for the mean of a discrete distribution, sum of r times p of r. And that comes out to be one on one minus pi two one, and that, therefore, is one plus beta on k minus one. I said in an earlier lecture, probably the first one, I think, that the number of shuttings per burst, the mean number of shuttings per burst is beta over k minus one, as one less than the number of openings per burst, pretty obviously. The bigger beta is compared with k minus one, the more times the channel will reopen on average. Now, how do I figure out that? And how do I figure out that? Well, there's two very neat results for the sums of series like this. Let's prove this one first. Uh, the sum from one to infinity, oops, of p to the r minus one, one minus p equals one. Well, that actually turns out to be very easy to prove because we can just write out the first few terms of this series. For r equals one, it's one minus p. For r equals two, it's p into one minus p. r equals three, it's p squared into one minus p. And if we multiply these out, we get one minus p plus p minus p squared plus p squared minus p cubed plus p cubed. Everything vanishes apart from the one. So that's very simple. And that gives us the proof that the area under the, well, the, 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 uh, the sum of all the probabilities comes to one. To, to get the mean of the distribution, we needed this sort of sum which comes out to one over one minus p. The idea is very much like the first one, so I'll leave you to go through that by yourself. So why are matrices so useful? We want to define bursts in the more general case. We've just done the case where there's one open state and one intraburst state. The matrices are now uh, allow you to write down expressions that are both short and are general for any mechanism because del Castillo cats is too simple for any real life receptor. P 
you have more than one open state and more than one state within birth, then matrices are ideal. We can't do it so easily by hand. And to analyze bursts, we divide, divide all of the states in which the receptor can exist, not into just open and shut as before, but into three sets. The open states, that's the same as before, Ka in number. Short-lived shut states, the states that it occupies when it's within a, a burst. Call that set B, Kb in number. And set C contains all the long-lived shut states, such that if ever a state in set C is entered, then the burst ends. So all shut states is B and C. This uh, sign here means the union of those two subsets. And the total number of shut states is KB plus KC. The total number of states, of course, is K as before. Now, of course, it's going to be it's going to be scope for error in deciding which states are short-lived shut states and which states are long-lived shut states. You can be pretty sure, for example, if you operate at a low agonist concentration, that the interval between the association events is going to be long and the lifetime of the vacant receptor will therefore be long. Um, but there's, there's a certain amount of arbitrariness, the approach is an approximate one. We can illustrate it by applying it to the simple case we've already looked at, the, the Q matrix, uh, the Del Castillo Katz mechanism. The Q matrix we have seen several times is like that. So rather than partitioning it into open and states and shut states, we, we partition it like that. And in this case, each of these sub matrices just has one element in it. Ka, Kb and Kc are all one. So for example, QAA is just minus alpha. We're now in a position to generalize the treatment of bursts. We've seen this picture before. This is bursts in the case of the Del Castillo Katz mechanism. It stays in the resting state for quite a long time at low agonist concentration. It, when it becomes occupied, it may then open. It doesn't necessarily, of course, it may shut without opening, but let's suppose it opens. It comes back to the intermediate state. It may then reopen and that might happen again and again. So the, that would produce bursts with four openings and three short shuttings separating them. Of course, you can also get this sort of thing. Uh, it just goes up to the open state and comes straight back to the resting state. So that has that burst has one opening and no short shuttings. Now we can generalize this very easily if we just change these three states to three sets of states: A open, B short lived shut, and C long lived shut. This, this is the definition of a burst, which is quite general for any mechanism. And to analyze this, it'll be convenient to define G matrices. 
these can be calculated just as in the case of open and shut distributions, we define GAF of T. They can all be calculated very directly from the Q matrix, so there's no mystery about them. They're just defined for brevity, really. So we want to define a, a probability density that describes a probability of staying open within subsets as the, sub, the A subset of states for a time T and leaving A for a state in subset B. The elements of this GAB matrix will be this. The probability that we stay in from time naught to T within the open states and leave A for state J between T and D plus delta T, given that we were in state I at naught. That's the, they're the probabilities in the P matrix, which is E to the QAAT, as we've seen before. The, these probabilities are QAB times delta T. Here, the I is an A state, and J is one of the short-lived shut states. So J is in B. Then, again, this is exactly like we had before, except we have B rather than F now. GAB of T is E to the QAAT. QAB, when we were considering open and shut times, we had QAF at the end, but that's otherwise the same. So these matrices are the standard thing that's used throughout the papers I've written with Alan Hawkes. We also need the probability of staying open within su subset of states A and then leaving for leaving A for a subset in for a state in subset B, regardless of how long it takes, we integrate over time. And as we've seen, we find this by setting S equals naught in the Platt transform, and we denote this probability simply G A B without the argument T. It's important, remember, to distinguish between GAB of T, which depends on time, and GAB, which doesn't depend on time. In fact, the Laplace transform of, of these quantities is what's used in many of the derivations. Just as a reminder, the Laplace transform of an ordinary exponential, e to the minus alpha t is alpha on one, alpha, one on alpha plus s, s being the frequency, uh, the Laplace variable with the dimensions of frequency. The Laplace transform of a matrix exponential, e to the QAAT, is exactly analogous. We don't say one over, we say the inverse of, and the S has to be multiplied by an identity matrix so that it's the same shape as QAA, but otherwise it's the same. So GAB of T is simply E to the QA of T times QAB. And its Laplace transform is given by that, the QAB is constant, so it's not a, just a, a multiplier. And the probabilities for A to B transitions, regardless of how long they take, we set S equals naught in that. It's just minus Q, the inverse of QAA times QAB. And once you've got the hang of results like this, you can, you can really read all of the 1982 paper we wrote 
with 59 pages and 400 odd equations. They're all just variations on that theme. And the virtue of this wonderful notation that Alan Hawkes invented is that you can just find the G matrices for any other transitions simply by interchanging subscripts. We found, for example, that transitions from open states to shortlist such states are defined by these probability densities, or regardless of how long it takes, and they're given by this. But what if we want the probabilities for the reverse route from open lived from short lived shut states to open states G B A F T? Well, we just interchange B and A in this, these expressions, so we get E to the Q B B T Q B A, and likewise for the equivalent when, regardless of the time they take. So that's all terribly simple and elegant. So now let's deal with a more complicated case where the burst contains two open states and two short-lived shut states. Here's a simple mechanism which involves binding of two agonist molecules and the monoliganded one can open and so can the diliganded one open. So there's two open states. Um, at low enough agonist concentration, we know this is the vacant receptor is going to last a long time. It's less clear whether this should be counted as a within burst state, but we'll assume for this purpose it, it should be. So set C, his long lived shut state, is just the vacant receptor. Set B, the short lived shut states of, of these two occupied but shut states. Set A are the two open states. So that's the Q matrix for this mechanism. We want to partition it like this. The two open states are there, the two short lived shut states are here, and the long lived shut states are there, and these various submatrices describe the transitions between those sets. For example, the top left hand bit QAA is given by that. There's a, a, yet another way we can partition the Q matrix. Bursts of openings by this definition are spent in either open states or short-lived shut states. So the, we can pool those together and call them the burst states. And that's subset B, E, sorry. So that's all the states, but the, apart from the, the long-lived shut state, state five, and that's, uh, and that yet another partition of the Q matrix. Everything is defined in terms of the Q matrix. So now let's see why matrices are really helpful with the openings per burst with two open states and two shut states. We did the <coughs> distribution of the number of openings per burst by hand in the case of the simple Del Castillo Katz mechanism that turned out to be fairly easy to do. How can we generalize it? Well, what's the probability of set A open states to set B short lived shut states back to A? That's what happens during a burst. What's the, what is the probability of those transitions occurring? Well, a burst must start 
in one of the open states, say there's a probability phi one that it starts in open state one, the monolight ended one, and a probability of phi two that it starts in open state two, the dilight ended one. Well, we need a special sort of probability to solve this sort of problem, the sort of probability we just found in the G matrix. It must allow for the being any number of transitions within A, the open states before A is left for B. So suppose that the burst starts in state one, transitions from A to B and back can occur by the following routes. You could go one, state one to three to one, that's not allowed in this particular mechanism, but it might in general be, or one to four to one. Or you could go one to three to two, or you could go one to four to two. Uh, the, the, this mechanism doesn't allow many of those, but in general, they're always possible. So the probabilities for those routes are G13, G31, G14, G41, G13, G32, G14, G42. And that's the probability, that's the probabilities of these different routes if the burst starts in state one. If it starts in state two, there are four more possibilities. For example, we could go two, three, one in general. The three, one transition isn't allowed in this mechanism, but it might be in general. So you get an, another set of probabilities where the first subscript is two. And these get impossibly complicated, but luckily they're all greatly simplified by the use of matrix notation. If we put together all those probabilities, we get something like this. If these are the probabilities if we start in state one, as those are. So then they have to be multiplied by the probability that we do stay, start in state one, phi one. These are the probabilities that we start in state two, multiplied by the probability that the burst does start in state two. So if we define some matrices that contain these probabilities. This is the probability that the burst starts in state one. That's the probability that it starts in state two. G, A, B. The first subscript is for an open state. G one, G two. The second subscript is the probability that it ends up in one of the B states, which is states three and four. Likewise, GBA is given by that, and UA is just a unit column vector that will sum the results over the A states. So we can write all this very simply as a matrix product like that. Multiplying out these matrices, you, you can soon check for yourself, lists all these probabilities and multiplies them by the appropriate initial starting probability. And it all comes down into this one general expression, which will still hold however many states that are in A and B. So, which one do you prefer? 
this or that. No choice. A couple more relevant things about GAB. Um, well, I'll, I'll skip that. You can read it for yourself. The one really important thing, though, we need to know about the G matrices is their infinite sums. We want often to know the probability of the occurrence of either naught or one or two transitions from A to B and back. So what the number of openings per burst can be anything from one up to infinity. The probabilities of those transitions are JB times GBA to the R. And that is comes out to be this. Likewise, if we're calculating a mean, we'd want to multiply each of these terms by R, and that comes out to be like that. Notice that these are exact analogues of the corresponding scalar identities. The sum of pi to the R is one on one minus pi. The sum of r pi to the r minus one is one minus pi to the minus two. So they're exactly analogs of the scalar identities. And in fact, if you write out the expansion of e to the QAA or, or whatever the matrix is, you can prove them in exactly the way we did for the scalar identities. So now we can do the general form of the number of openings per burst. We've also already worked it out in the case of the simple Del Castillo catch mechanism. We can now generalize that. A burst consists of either one or two or three transitions from A to B and back. Which, just considering the number of openings in a burst, so the time doesn't matter. We set S equals naught in the Laplace transform. In other words, we integrate over all possible times and we use the simple GAB matrix without the time involved. So the probability of getting R openings is just GAB times GBA to the R minus one. That's the first R openings. And then this is the probability that the burst ends. Phi B is the initial one by Ka vector. Can, that contains the probabilities that the first opening in a burst starts in each of the open states. So we'll come to that in a minute. It's calculated like everything else directly from the Q matrix. The final column vector of ones just adds up over all the open states. The mean of this distribution is found as the sum of r times p of r and the results on the previous slide shows that that's simply that. And these are exactly like the previous simple scalar results. Pi to one to the r minus one one minus pi two one with mean one over one minus pi two one. So GAB GBA replaces pi two one in the simple case. 
well, actually, it's, the analogy is more obvious if we just say it replaces pi one two pi two one. But in the same case of the simple uh, a del Castello Katz mechanism, pi one two was one. So there we have the distribution of the number of openings per burst for any such mechanism. Okay, now we've got to deal with the, this initial vector again. It won't be quite the same as for openings. It contains the probability that the first opening in a burst starts in each of the open states. That's not necessarily the same as the probability that, that that any opening starts starts in the um, each of the open states. The first opening in a burst is defined as one that occurs after a sojourn in one of the long-lived shut states in subset C. So we want to start with the steady state occupancies in the, the, the C states, PC at infinity, the equilibrium occupancies. And we then want to look at the transition from state A, from state C to the open states A. It can go directly from C to A if the mechanism allows that, or indirectly by going via the short-lived shut states. So, it stands to intuitive reason that the rates from going from C to A directly are in QCA. The rates from going from C to B are in QCB, but then we want the, the to be a transition from B to A, so we end up in A either way. Doesn't matter how long that takes, but and that's so it's just a GBA matrix. The denominator is just the sum of the terms in the numerator. As, uh, so we simply post multiply the numerator by a unit column vector to get a scalar. So this is again a, a one by ka row vector, which contains the probabilities of the first opening in a burst starting in each of the open states. So now we can get on to the thing which we really want to know the distribution of the burst length, the length of a single activation at the the, the length of a single activation in a synapse. So here again is the general representation of The bursting process. A, the set of open states, A, the set of short lived shut states, B, the set of long lived shut states, C. Producing a burst of, with four openings, or in this case, a burst with one opening. And the probability of getting R openings we have already discovered is, is that. So how can we get the distribution of the length of this burst of openings? Well, it's going to be a giant convolution problem. Obviously, we're adding the lengths of random intervals. And let's do it term by term. The time spent up to this point is GAB 
star of S, the, of the Laplace transform of that time will be given by this times GBA star S. And this happens three times up to there. So it's cubed. That's just multiplying the Laplace transforms to get the convolution. The last one we have to treat slightly differently because that's going from A to B, but then it's going back to C. So that's, we want the time that's spent in A here to be counted. So that's got an S in it. But then this last silent bit of the burst, we don't want to count the time of it because you can't see it. So that's just GBC, the dimensionless probabilities regardless of time. This is the wonderful thing about the Hawkes notation is if you don't want to count the time, you just set S equal to naught in the Laplace transform. This one was a single opening, which returned after opening directly to the C states. So we want the length of that opening. We want the time spent in A, but then returns directly to C. The mechanism allows that. So how can we generalize this? Just as before, we're going to have GAB, GBA to the R minus one, that was cubed here for a burst of length four, added up over all possible burst lengths from R equals one to infinity, times the bit that describes the end of the burst, that's the, the last opening in the burst, plus followed by a transition to the C states, the long loop shut states. And we also have to take into account it may go directly from the open state to the C state. That's added up over the C states. It's multiplied by the initial vector, so it's a scalar. And that's the Laplace transform of the burst length distribution. So we've got the Laplace transform of the probability density that we want. How do we invert it? Well, that sum we can write this way. We've already established these infinite sums of things you've of this form. But the Laplace variable S occurs in four different places in that. And it's not obvious how to invert it. I'm especially fond of this one because it's one of the few occasions when I beat Alan Hawkes to the find the inverse of the Laplace transform. The result is very simple and elegant. And it comes out to be this. I'm not going to go through the details. It took several pages of working to figure it out. We start with the initial vector. We spend time in the burst states. That's either A or B for time T but we start and end in an open state. So this is the AA partition of this KE by KE matrix. And the rest is not time dependent. It just describes how the burst ends. So that's the time spent in the burst states E. We want, only want the K A by K uh, submatrix of that. And the burst, this is a probability, essentially the burst fails to continue, which in the case of the simple case was pi two one to the R minus one, one minus pi two one. So that's the analog of one minus pi two one in the castillo katz case. So E to the QEET is a KE by KE matrix. 
that shows you immediately that the burst length distribution will have can be written in the form of a scalar sum of ke exponentials ke remember is the number of open states plus the number of short-lived shut states ka plus kb and just as before you can find the area of each component by the spectral expansion of QEE. It's exactly analogous to previous cases we've done. We can now simplify the appearance of that burst length distribution a bit more. The um, form we've got so far is that. We can define an n vector, not depending on time, that describes how the burst can end. It can end by going from A to B and B to C, or directly from A to C. So you can make the distribution of the burst length, in any case, look even simpler. It comes out to be that. or equivalently that. One final example of the beauty of Alan Hawke's notation is how simple it is to find other distributions. Suppose we want the distribution of the total open time per burst. And since the interruptions within the burst are quite short, this is going to be quite close to the burst length, but it will be a little bit shorter because it can encounter only the open times. Well, this was our distribution of the full burst length. For the open time per burst, we aren't interested in the shut time within bursts. So the shut times within bursts are described and all that, the Platz transform is that. So all we have to do is to set S equals naught in that term there. At the only time we, it, we get a, a B to A transition in this expression. So we just set S equals naught and we end up with that. Again, it's not obvious how you invert it. It's still got the S in three different places. But Alan Hawkes found that it was given by that, which looks exactly like an open time distribution, except rather than QAA, we have VAA which is defined as that, come, 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 calculated directly from the Q matrix. And what that shows is that the distribution of open times per burst is, has fewer components than the distribution of the burst length because VAA of T is Ka by Ka just the number of components is the number of open states just as it would be for a simple open time distribution. It can be expressed as a mixture of Ka exponentials just as the open time distribution can be but of course it will be longer because this is the distribution of the total open time in a burst. Okay, and that is the end of bursts. We've done quite a bit of algebra, but all we need to calculate things like the macroscopic current or distributions of open times or burst lengths can be expressed in really by these two matrices e to the qa t qa b 
and its equivalent after you set s equals naught in the Laplace transform to give the probabilities of those transitions regardless of the time it takes. Of course, there are lots of permutations of these subscripts you can have a states to c states a states to shut states so that would be qaf in that case as we encountered already for the for the distributions we also need the initial vector but that too can be calculated directly from the subsections of the q matrix so with all you need to know really is these definitions and knowing how to do the spectral expansion trick. You can calculate even quite complicated things like the distribution of the burst length and express it as a sum of scalar exponentials with areas that add up to one. And that's it for burst lengths. Of course, it would be better if, as on our course, you could have sat with laptops and worked these things out for yourself. At some point, I'll supply the MathCAD worksheets that went with this course. This was the 2007 course with people from all over the world. This was one of the practical cor cor courses in the afternoon uh, that's Andrew Plested in this case um, but Andrew and Remis Lappe were stalwarts of the, the supervision of these calculations Marco Beato also took place in the earlier courses as a tutor Each year we gave out a mug and the mug had some variant of this sort of design. It had the burst length distribution on it, which is my favorite one because, um, <laughs> largely because I beat Alan to the finding the inverse and it came out in this very elegant way. So next time we deal with non-steady state things.